Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another conversation with regard to the Northern Plains military frontier in the late 19th century. Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Don Rickey, a noted authority on the military frontier, specifically the life of the common soldier. Our program this afternoon is the lot of the common soldier in the frontier army, or in other words, 40 miles a day on beans and hay. Dr. Rickey, we're going to begin our conversation with regard to this array of equipment, these arms and equipment here, with the uniform of the frontier soldier. Perhaps you want to begin by making a few comments about the uniform. Well, if the uniform was, uh, that we're going to show today, talk about, was the, that which was worn uh, for duty, regular duty in the post, except for some particular dress parade or Sunday inspection, something like that, and which was also the same uniform that was worn out on campaign. There was only one weight of it, and it was invariably of blue wool. Uh, the uh, trousers here being a little lighter shade than the navy blue of the, uh, the blouse. Now, incidentally, Larry, I think maybe uh, it, you could say a, a word or two about that, that 40 miles a day on beans and hay. To explain where that came from, it is part of the, uh, the chorus of the most popular song uh, during the, the period of the, uh, the Indian Wars uh, called the Regular Army O. And that, the, the chorus uh, went, uh, the drums they roll upon my soul and this is the way we go. 40 miles a day on beans and hay in the regular army old. So uh, I imagine that you'd have some people would ask where that had come from. Well, that's where it came from. But this uniform is indeed wool. It seems very heavy. Yes, indeed. It was meant to, uh, to be worn under all conditions. And, uh, but people wore heavier clothes in the 19th century than we're used to. In the first place, there was no central heating, particularly at military posts. So people accustomed themselves, if they wish to be warm, uh, they, they put on more clothes, and that's the way people lived. In the summertime, people took off fewer clothes, incidentally. The standard uh, undergarments were what we would call uh, long handles, two-piece, uh, shirt and, and uh, trousers, drawers. And the shirt was, uh, until 1875, nearly always gray. Now, in summertime, there was occasionally uh, men would be allowed to wear calico civilian shirts, but uh, this was the common uh, pullover flannel shirt, and they wore, as, as we said, this uh, blue wool trousers, and this would be an infantry private's fatigue or service blouse, five buttons. Before 1872, it would have been four buttons and a little looser fit. Uh, this light blue that you see here uh, is what would indicate that this man was in the infantry. If he'd been in the cavalry, it would have been light yellow. Or in the artillery, which are very few in the frontier, uh, red. So this was a man's everyday uh, dress. Well, he did not, he just wore the blouse and the trousers and his forage cap or kepi, which this one uh, is an original that happens to have been for a, uh, a musician, isn't it? Well, either that or a bugler in the 7th Infantry or 7th Cavalry. Uh -huh. Now let me ask one question about these. You know, could, is it possible that a man could march 40 days dressed like this, or excuse me, 40 miles dressed in well, something as heavy as that? Well, exaggeration. The average march was really closer between 10 and 20. So uh, really, the weight of the clothing really wasn't that important in no, terms of how far they no, come. And, and it was generally, uh, fairly healthy because men would get rained on and wool, of course, if you get rained on and all wet, you just wear it until it dries out. And uh, same thing as sleeping at night in order to keep, people did not, uh, uh, particularly out on campaign, they did not take their clothes off. They just took off maybe their boots or shoes. And incidentally, the infantrymen wore a, a heavy black ankle length shoe. Uh, ankle high shoe, which uh, called a Jefferson shoe. Um, and this was his everyday uh, footgear. Later on, in the late 1880s, he adopted special barrack, what they call a barrack shoe, which is made of light stuff. But it, we'll, what we are looking at here today is material mainly from the middle to late 1870s. 
Now, one other question about with regard to the clothing, you know, if you wore it all the time, how could you possibly keep it clean? Well, <clears throat> mainly by brushing, or when the thing needed to be cleaned, as we would understand it, like washed or dry cleaned, there were, uh, on the military post, usually, if the, if the company commander, the captain, uh, approved of it, laundresses, like by long-standing regulation up until 1878, a captain could appoint one laundress for every 19 and a half men in his company, and the laundresses were carried on the company rolls. Uh, that, that meant that they, they were due a quarter's allowance and a wood heating allowance. Uh, they were not rationed, and they, they earned their income by the soldiers being assessed a dollar a month for their services as laundresses, uh, which wasn't bad if you stop to think of it. The pay was every two months. Well, every two months that meant a laundress would get a dollar uh, or the 50 cents a month. Well, it would be two dollars from each man. And from the pay table, the laundress had first call. Uh, and after the laundress, incidentally, the post sutler who may have extended credit to a soldier. But these laundresses uh, received uh, every two months about two dollars from each man in the company, which, as we've already said, uh, say that would be uh, if you've got one laundress for every 20 men or so, you would have uh, 20 dollars uh, once every two months. And if there were more men in the company and fewer laundresses, the, the money would be a little better. Now, most of these women were middle-aged and older women who were married to uh, non-commissioned officers who were uh, career, uh, career soldiers. There were a few that were single, uh, but uh, this was uncommon. So you might even say that they were career laundresses along with the career soldiers. Exactly so. That's kind of the way it amounts now, to. Part of the reorganization of the Army, the law of, 18, of June 18, 1878, they had decided to eliminate laundresses at the end of five years, that there would be no new appointees. So until 1883, uh, these laundresses did stay on. After that, they stayed on. They just didn't get the, they were not given a, a quarters and a heating allowance. But that, that doesn't mean that they disappeared. They just, they lost their official status. That's all. <laughs> How did the, did the soldiers have to buy their own clothes? Uh, the initial issue was uh, given to them. And then they were given a clothing allowance from which they were expected to maintain the, the uniform. And the clothes were drawn every so often. And there was some uh, motivation to be careful with your clothing because any clothing allowance not expended would uh, belong to the soldier at the time of discharge. Ah. So there were different ways of uh, economizing, maybe buying uniform parts from uh, men who were going on discharge or taking, uh, buying them at auction of men who had deserted or uh, perhaps uh, uh, been, been casualties and were thus uh, no longer on the rolls. Uh, usually, when they went on a campaign, for instance, the soldier did not take his best clothes with him, but he took those that he thought that he could best uh, afford to, to have uh, spoiled by hard service out in, uh, in the field. So there was even kind of a, a recycling at that time of uniforms and that oh, sort yes, of business. Yes. Well, the Army was very uh, uh, careful of spending money on uniforms. Uh, for instance, a new type of uniform, this improved one, was adopted in 1872 after existing supplies of Civil War period uniforms were getting, uh, were running out, which, by the way, they, many of them had been of very poor quality. Uh, that uh, shoes that fell apart when uh, they were gotten wet, clothing and wool that turned out to be uh, really a kind of shoddy uh, felting that, again, would disintegrate in the rain, so that uh, by 1872, when this, this new issues were authorized, uh, it was very much welcome. But Congress put a hooker in this. None of the new material was to be issued until existing supplies had been used up. So uh, even, was, even at that time, we had frugality and economy in government as, oh, a, primary, yes, as yes. a primary issue. And inevitably, in those times, the Army uh, was the last thing to be considered. As a matter of fact, in the year 1877, there was such a amount of uh, wrangling in Congress over these matters as to what to spend and what not to spend, that there was no pay appropriated for the Army that year. 
Uh, so the enlisted men always paid the price, basically, for yes, their and officers during that particular year had to go to private sources to borrow money against their pay. That's really amazing. Uh, we should move on to this next uh, array of equipment. This is in-company gear. Well, this would be in-post. In-post gear. I'm in sorry. In-post uh, uh, equipment to be used uh, in guard in guard duty, guard mount, retreat parades, and other. Uh, in post uh, duties under arms. This, this is this is specifically what here. This is a, this is a waist belt, a McKeever cartridge box to hold 20 cartridges, 20 of these uh, 45 government rifle cartridges in these loops. Usually, a soldier held three such cartridges in here, highly shined. Why? because they had an inspection to pass at the time that they went on guard, and this was, uh, uh, they were expected to be highly shined. It's part of the whole orderly bucker syndrome. Where you shined your, you shined your ammunition. And, well, uh, three of the cartridges anyway, which one would be careful never to expend. Okay, so, but the, the, it, it, as a matter of practice, all of, the, all of the cartridge loops in there would be filled. No, only three. Only three? For, for ceremonial guard purposes, yes. Okay. Uh, now, th this waist belt would, of course, also held a bayonet, which went on the end of this infantry rifle, like this, mm -hmm. which was literally never used out on, on the, in the field. Well, why not? Uh, well, you, uh, this was originally intended to be used in a kind of uh, uh, European or American type uh, military encounters, uh, charges and counter charges for close order fighting. The Plains Indians did not elect to fight this way. And uh, for an infantryman to get within bayonet thrust range of uh, a Plains Indian was, would have been uh, literally impossible. It is ironic, though, that uh, the famous uh, Sioux uh, leader, Crazy Horse, who had turned himself in or at least come in on demand to Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Uh, was then taken to the guardhouse under guard, and then he suddenly realized what they were doing to him, that they were going to put him in a cell. And he tried to break free, and a soldier on guard stabbed him with a bayonet. And that was just about the, the only Plains Indian I could think of that, that passed out from this life into the next as a result of a bayonet wound. Well, let me ask one other question with regard to the bayonet then. As a, if, if it was never used, uh, did the soldiers keep them with them at all times? Was that, was that required? They were never taken, or it was infrequent that they would even be taken on uh, campaign mm -hmm. into the field. So this was really just in post stuff. Uh, now, of course, the rifle was intended to be, the same arms are used, but when they went out on campaign with much more serious purpose. Now this weapon, as an improvement over the muzzle-loading system that had been in use long before the Civil War, where ammunition was introduced to the, the muzzle and <clears throat> loaded with a ramrod, and the um, charge exploded by a percussion cap on a nipple down here. Well, this system was invented by a man named Allen in the Springfield Arsenal, and you can see what it is. It's a way of having a breech-loading system, which has introduced the one cartridge at a time in there, and close this breech, and there's a long firing pin in there. And when this hammer is then is released down on there, to, that's what makes the pin hit the, uh, the, cart the primer of the cartridge and ignite the charge, all of which, of course, is happening instantaneously. It would be really quite an effective uh, military weapon. Uh, very long range, but in, by the standards of the time, much longer range than had been the previous 50 caliber arms and the earlier 58 caliber Civil War rifle muskets. Uh, usually, in the course of a, of a skirmish with, with Plains Indians, the troops were able to keep their opponents at a distance so that the light, more lightly armed Indians frequently were not able to get within range of, of the soldiers. Now, what, was there been a change in, with regard to the, to the kind of weaponry and ammunition issued to the, to the troops over time on the Northern Plains frontier? Well, there was from, uh, from in 1866, a breech loader that looks similar to this was adopted. Now, this was an improvement of that uh, adopted in 1873. And the 1873 models, with minor variations, improvements, uh, 
remained standard issue in the regular army until the adoption of the bolt action magazine Craig Jorgensen rifle in 1892. So all through the rest of the Indian uh, frontier period, this remained the, the standard uh, infantry arm. Incidentally, for cavalry, you'd had the same weapon, except it had been somewhat shorter, about so much shorter, and with the, the stock only coming up to about here, and then, a, say, a 22-inch barrel. But this was the standard infantry rifle. Now, based on the different sizes of shells you have here, Don, uh, was there a change in effectiveness over, uh, well, over time? This, the, now, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, frequently, uh, the point of it is people make the point that a good many uh, uh, the Plains warriors uh, had uh, Winchester repeating arms, carbines or rifles. Well, this is the cartridge for the 1866 Winchester. It's a rim fire, and it carries about 28 grains of powder in a light bullet. Now, it's true, you could fire 16 times. However, compare here, you can see that the larger 45 government rifle cartridge is much, uh, carries a much heavier charge, much bigger bullet. This had at least two to even three times the range of this short room fire, and it's much more effective in terms of impact as what happens to whatever you happen to shoot at. And uh, that, by the way, in combat was the most important thing, not how many times you could fire, but what happened when you were able to hit what it was you were firing at. And this is by far more effective cartridge. So uh, the, the Army was well armed, and these arms, incidentally, were capable of uh, sustaining a lot of abuse and very little cleaning, which were some of the criteria that uh, were put on uh, the adoption of these weapons, whereas none of the Winchesters could pass those tests. Uh, they would uh, clog up or uh, refuse to function uh, in the same tests that these weapons could pass. Okay. Now, oftentimes in the, in the, in the movies that depict the Frontier Army, the, the men are also wearing sidearms. Was that common as well? Well, not so much side. Well, in the, in the cavalry, the pistols were most frequently issued. And some men owned individually, or may have owned a pistol or a revolver, but uh, not in the infantry, not, not usually. Now, to move out from in post duty to uh, a campaign situation, when the soldier went out on campaign, he had the same uniform. With the possible exception, he sometimes, uh, sometimes this cap he was worn, sometimes a, a kind of uh, almost shapeless black slouch hat. Uh, particularly after 1875. Uh, now, <clears throat> after having donned that uniform, he, he frequently would tuck the trouser legs into the top of his uh, gray socks to keep dust out from his marching down there. And uh, ammunition, rather than being carried in that cartridge box here, is not carried in a loop belt. This happens to be in 1876-77 loop belt made of canvas loops sewn over a, a um, leather core and it held about 45 cartridges. Now, a belt full of these cartridges around the hips was fairly heavy, but it's better than having the same amount of cartridges carried in a box where all the weight would be in, in one place. So usually it was a cartridge belt worn. Now, to sustain himself uh, out in the field, the soldier carried a canteen, to, such as this one, which held about a quart of water. These are canteens left over from the Civil War that were recovered and with new straps put on them. And now to provide uh, himself with, with rations and equipment, incidentally, this knife would have been frequently added to the, the field gear. This is an all-purpose butcher knife and worn on the cartridge belt, as a rule. Now, a, uh, his, his sort of uh, all-purpose uh, carrier was his um, haversack, which was this piece of equipment here, a waterproof cover, and uh, very frequently a, a neckerchief was worn around the neck to absorb perspiration and <clears throat> 
uh, keep the dust down a little bit. Uh, in this haversack, soldier carried such things as, well, perhaps a, a stub of candle, uh, a little tobacco sack. Most men either smoke, if they smoked tobacco, it was a pipe, or they chewed. A few rolled a new kind of cigarettes, which were coming. That, that was an influence that came from up from the Rio Grande, the Mexican influence. And uh, a very few uh, smoked uh, the rare cigar, which were 10 cents a piece, which the soldiers' pay was pretty expensive. Now, in this haversack, the man also carried his rations, usually from anywhere from one to three days. And his ration consisted of several uh, hardtack trackers, uh, what they called hard bread, and uh, a pound or so of salt pork, which incidentally was not the salt pork that you would see in the market today, but the, uh, the practice in those times was to, when, when they, uh, when, if they're going to put up salt pork, they butcher the whole animal, and the whole animal would then be cut up, the whole uh, pig carcass, and put in barrels with uh, salt water. So it was real meat that they were getting, and not just, uh, just fat back. And the same thing was true with uh, the bacon. Now, the bacon was uh, usually as meaty as they could get and uh, salt cured and uh, smoked. So uh, then to drink coffee, with sugar, which when they meant sugar, it meant uh, what we would call brown sugar. And they'd usually have some coffee in the green, green beans, a bean coffee that had to be roasted, either in a cup here, or in what we're going to pull out in a second, this mess kit, and then another little sack for uh, the sugar. Now, for preparing his food, the soldier had, after 1874, this mess kit. Before that, he had a little, uh, he provided himself, really, with a, uh, usually with a little skillet. Well, this is a combination skillet here and plate. Now, this was meant to be also what they called the meat can, where the salt pork or the bacon would be put in here and carried this way. Now, when, you, when they did that, in warm weather, all the fat would melt and run out down the bottom here. Well, you can imagine the, what the the condition of the haversack would be after a couple of weeks on campaign. So in any case, the way this stuff was prepared is usually to fry up your salt pork and bacon first, then put your hardtack crackers in there to soften them up in the, in, by frying them in grease, and then perhaps use a little of that brown sugar on there, and I can assure you that that tastes considerably like pie crust, because you've got the flour and uh, the shortening provided by the grease, and a little bit of sugar, and that's really not bad at all. Something that uh, was frequently known as skilly galoo by the soldiers. Mm -hmm. So here's, uh, that's the soldier's rations and how he uh, prepared them and carried them. And we'll just put this back in the haversack now. Now, it <coughs> also in the haversack were uh, such things, provided a soldier wanted to carry him as uh, his sewing kit. Yeah, and of course, he had his, uh, his utensils, his knife and fork and spoon, which were carried also in little containers in the side. And these, by the way, are all original items. Uh, here, that's his, his tableware. Now, Sometimes the men carried shelter tents, which, which one man carried, each man carried a half of a shelter tent and was then buttoned together and would make what was later on to be called a pup tent with no ends to it, just shelter from straight up, straight uh, above you. Uh, but frequently they didn't carry any tenting at all. And sometimes the tents, when in somewhat larger A tents, which would accommodate three to four men, were carried in an accompanying uh, escort wagon. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the escort wagon would be what would be used to carry the blanket rolls and the haversacks if they had one along with them. Because this, for the individual to carry this stuff was, was pretty heavy. Now, I already mentioned cooking in the mess kit and in this cup, which was usually carried by looping it through there. And this cup was not only for drinking in, but for cooking one's coffee. It, 
uh, get the beans roasted, crush them between rocks, put them in there with water, and that's how the coffee was made. Uh, <clears throat> now at night, uh, in order to, to arrange for uh, sleeping, men usually carried one blanket and a rubber ground cloth apiece in this blanket roll that went over the shoulder from, from like this. Yeah, that, you've got the idea there, Larry. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Let's we'll see if we can get it off now here. Right. <laughs> here we go. And uh, the men slept two together so that each man got the benefit of two blankets and two ground cloths. Of course, this could be pretty uh, rigorous campaign in the wintertime, uh, especially, but uh, to carry all this stuff in the summertime, where uh, in uh, that one uh, uh, Fort Buford soldier's diary, Private Sanford, the 6th Infantry in 1876, he recorded that within one 24-hour period, the temperature went from over 100 degrees down to 54 degrees. Well, marching at 100 degrees with all this stuff on was considerably uh, a hardship. And uh, uh, of course, having uh, those radical temperature changes, which are common in the Northern Plains, uh, was one of the hardships that uh, had a tendency to make uh, old men out of young men and through uh, arthritis <laughs> and so on. Long, uh, and this was a, a very real hardship. But how much weight are we talking about with this equipment? Well, altogether, probably uh, including the rifle and uh, full rations here, full canteen, you're probably talking uh, probably 30 or 40 pounds. So on a long, on an extended campaign, uh, this, this material would get, this, this burden would get to be fairly onerous. So you got, you, oh, you yes, yeah. yeah. That's why it was uh, so, so desirable, if at all possible, to have an escort wagon along. Of course, so sometimes they didn't when they were attempting to, to move uh, with greatest rapidity in order to pursue uh, bands of, uh, of, of Indians. They might uh, go without any or just with pack mules mm -hmm. rather than, than even have an escort wagon. So it was a trade-off. Uh, in Crook's campaign, his so-called starvation march, of, uh, in the summer, late summer and early fall of 1876, his men were 56 days, with, uh, which was much longer than they were rationed for because of rain almost every other day, 56 days on the, on the out. And by, by the time they'd been gone about 30-odd uh, oh, days, they were reduced to butchering worn-out Indian ponies and horses. So uh, it's, it was, could be pretty... Uh, pretty difficult campaign conditions. In that case, Crook had, had taken the gambler's chance. He knew he couldn't catch the Indians if he had to take supply wagons. He knew that he might run short on rations if he only took what he could carry in pack mules. And in this case, uh, the, the, the rations did run out. Although in the, the overall effect was that he was able to, to uh, encourage several bands of Indian Sioux to surrender by having Another engagement with them at Slim Buttes, just across the line down in south, uh, western South Dakota. As a rule, you know, if we could make a general statement about this equipment and about the average uh, frontier soldier in, on the northern Great Plains with regard to his equipment, would you say that he was good, well equipped, poorly equipped? Uh, uh, how, how would you rate that if you, you, know, well, if you asked to make a general statement? Uh, the equipment was uh, as good, if not better, than other military equipment for field service of those times in other uh, standing armies. So basically, the northern great, the, the, the image of the northern frontier a soldier as a poorly equipped, ill-housed, ill-clothed, and ill-fed uh, individual in an army is probably not entirely well, true. Well, as I say, it, it changed over time. As, as the uniforms improved after 1872 and the weapons did, uh, they, for instance, pretty well abandoned using the knapsack the backpack mm -hmm. in favor of this, a lighter and more manageable system. And so, uh, went to loop cartridge belts to distribute the weight of the ammunition around the body rather than just all in one place in a big cartridge box. Mm -hmm. So uh, things uh, improved gradually in terms of equipment and uniforms too as they had in living conditions in the post. Thank you, Don Rickey. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking with, with Dr. Don Rickey who has been talking about the arms and equipment that were a common part of the life of the, of the life and the lot, I might say, of the common soldier on the Northern Plains frontier in the late 19th century. I'm Larry Remily. Thank you.